So my research program is focused on developing and applying machine learning methods for a, a broad range of problems in, uh, in biomedicine, kind of ranging from virology and systems biology to a number of clinical applications. So I thought what I would do uh, with my 20 minutes is to tell you about a few, what I see as lessons learned from our studies where we've been looking at trying to predict um, various clinical outcomes. So just to give you an overview of the, the general task that we'll be considering in the next few minutes, the idea is that we're given a clinical history of a patient as represented in their electronic health record, and as well as demographics, and in some cases we may have genetics on the patients as well. And then we're thinking about, we're given some kind of decision point in time, and what we would like to do is to ask, is this subject at risk for a particular adverse outcome? So the, um, the, the way that, that we focused on addressing this in my group is to think about using machine learning methods, where the idea is we're going to collect uh, a, a cohort of subjects where we have their clinical histories, where we know their outcomes, right? So you can think about these as the, the X vectors representing some summary of their clinical history and their demographics and genetics. Y now is representing some kind of outcome. And we'll give this to a machine learning algorithm that will give us back some kind of black box where now we can make predictions for new subjects we haven't seen before. So one particular uh, application we've worked on is looking at trying to predict risk for VTEs for patients who have been hospitalized. So in this case, we're looking at the clinical history again as recorded in the EHR up through some period of hospitalization. And then when they're about to be released, we want to make the prediction do we think that this patient's going to have a VTE sometime within the, the next 90 days? Okay. And uh, for this study, we, we looked at a, a data set where we had about 720 subjects where cases and controls were identified by expert review of the charts. And uh, for the results I'll tell you about, we looked at using two different sets of variables for trying to make these predictions. So one of them involved about 120 features, which were based on looking at known risk factors for VTE, as reported in the literature, and now mapping these down into to variables that we could actually see manifested in, in the EHR. And then the other representation involved looking at all kinds of variables that we saw recorded with sufficient frequency in our population. Right? So if we saw some kind of event happening in at least five subjects, then we would include that in the representation. So this we, we call the unabridged or the kitchen sink representation. And down below, I'm showing my, my collaborators here who uh, worked on this project. And so just to give you a, a sense of, of the fact that we can, this is a task that we can predict with moderately good accuracy, here's an ROC curve based on making predictions for out of sample patients. And um, um, as you can see, there's, there's notable predictive accuracy here. So now let's think about some of the lessons that, we, that I would claim we've learned from this study and from other studies. So one of them is that um, in many cases, I would argue that we can learn, we can get risk assessment models that have greater accuracy than more conventional risk scoring systems by learning models directly from data. And closely related to that, I would make the argument that um, in many cases that it's a good idea to throw almost all the variables you have into the process, give them to the learning model, because you can identify or potentially identify new risk and protective factors. So in the case of the, the VTE domain, uh, we, we looked at these questions by comparing several different representations. So one was this first one, this, this set of curated features, right? Variables that are being elicited from the EHR that corresponded to well-known risk factors. And then the other was the unabridged representation, right, where we're throwing in all kinds of events, diagnoses, procedures, meds, vitals, everything that was recorded into the model. And then we also compared this to a couple of um, off-the-shelf risk assessment models for VTE. So these scoring systems were not developed for the specific context we were looking at, post-hospitalization VTE but they were developed for VTE in general. And what we did is we took these scoring schemes and then mapped them to variables that we could actually automatically, again, extract from the, the EHR to, to run the scoring algorithm. 
And so what we're looking at here is, is an experiment where we use these three approaches and we ask each approach to identify the same size set of subjects that, were at the, we, that the model thought was at highest risk for VTE. And now we're looking at survival in the sense of how long did these subjects go without having a VTE in the 90 days post-hospitalization. So what you can see um, up at the top is the black line is representing just the survival curve for the entire patient population here. And then the, the red and the blue are representing survival for two of these conventional risk assessment tools for VTE. And then the, the lower two lines are representing survival curves resulting from two learned models. So the, the gold one is for the best model that was using the curated features, right, the known risk factors. And then the green line is the one showing the model learned from the kitchen sink, right, where it's given 3,000 some variables to learn to predict this. So as you can see, that the, the learned models are doing a better job at identifying the high risk patients. And moreover, the model that's looking at the full richness of what's recorded in the EHR, or a large subset of it, is providing us with the, the best predictions. So an, another application that we've looked at is, is predicting asthma exacerbations. And again, we're doing this in the context of looking at recent clinical histories as recorded in the EHRs, as well as using demographic data. And so in, in this case, um, the event that we're trying to predict exacerbations were phenotyped by developing a rule, which is looking at the EHR and, and looking for um, a certain type of event with the right kind of, of, of diagnoses recorded at that event, followed shortly after by a prescription for oral corticosteroids. And so, again, just to, to give you a sense of what predictive ac accuracy looks like in this domain, here are ROC curves for predicting exacerbations for two models, which are both logistic regression models or regularized logistic regression models. And um, in this case, we're seeing somewhat a similar lesson to what we saw in the VTE case, in that the distinction between the two models being shown here is that one of them is trained given only that the, the features that we anticipated would be highly predictive. So things like asthma control scores, um, past exacerbations. And then the other, the blue line, was trained giving it basically the, the kitchen sink again. All kinds of events we saw recorded in, in the EHR. So another lesson I would argue is that in some applications we can learn more accurate models by taking into account patient genetics. So in the VTE case, this is something that we tried. We looked at augmenting the feature representation with about 30 uh, SNPs that have been identified in, in GWAS and letting the models use those features in addition to the clinical features. And what we found there was that the SNPs had predictive value, right? They identified patients who were at high risk, but that predictive value was completely swamped by the clinical data. Right. So in that particular application, it seems like once you've seen the clinical history of these subjects, it's telling you all the information, at least that we could elicit, that, that was present in the genetic data. But I'll tell you about another study that's been led by my colleague Beth Burnside, where they've looked at predicting risk for breast cancer. So this is a, a study where they had subjects for whom they had both mammography data and, um, and SNPs from a SNP array. And cases and controls in this case are, are determined by looking at the, the cancer registry. And what they, one of the questions they looked at doing, one of the questions they looked at was could they get better risk assessments by using both mammography and the genetic data? And one thing that they, they took advantage of in their approach is that, of course, for both the genetic and mammography features, there's, there's a lot of structure that is going to relate the variables that you have. So what I'm showing you up here is, is a diagram showing uh, kind of the hierarchy of the, the, the BIRAD descriptors that are typically used to, to summarize mammographic findings. And so one thing they investigated was using a learning algorithm that could take into account this structure. And so I, I won't go into the, the math details there, but what they're doing is they're learning a special regularized logistic regression model it's taking into account the usual logistic regression function when you're trying to optimize the parameters, as well as taking into account the fact that really what you'd like to do in this case is, is select certain subsets of the variables. 
right, according to groups that are defined by the structure you have, such as the, um, uh, such as the, the, the organization of the mammography descriptors. And then taking into account that when you select one of these groups that you probably want to have similar coefficients over the, the variable selected in the group. So here's, um, here's one finding from their study. So what's being shown here are figures showing area under the ROC curves, again, for out-of-sample data. And the three rows are representing the results of the models when we use just the mammography features, just the SNPs, and both of them together. And again, the SNPs here were uh, a set of SNPs that have been identified in, in previous GWAS. So the, the, uh, the leftmost column of results there is showing what happens if you use ordinary logistic regression models on this particular application. And what you can see there is that you're not seeing any kind of benefit at all from combining the mammography and the SNP data. And then the middle column is, is showing, well, what if you actually optimize your parameters using this structure leveraged approach that I mentioned? And two things you can see. So one is you get better predictive accuracy, but moreover, you're now seeing a benefit from incorporating both sources of data, mammography and the SNPs. And in, in a follow-up study, uh, Shara Feld looked at the predictive value of these sources of data depending on the age of the subjects. And so what's being shown here is if, if we separate out the subjects to between those who are under 60, those who are 60 and older, and then looking at the predictive value of the, the various types of features, then perhaps not surprisingly what, we, what you see is that if you're looking at a very young subject, the genetics are quite informative, mammography not so much, whereas if you're looking at an older subject, then the, the case is reversed. So another lesson that I'd like to, to point out or argue is that even though there's a whole lot of activity right now, I would say a whole lot of success stories and a whole lot of hype around deep learning and more sophisticated machine learning models, that in many cases, simple linear methods like logistic regression work really, really well. So here's one result just from our lab. This is coming back to the task of predicting asthma exacerbations. So what I'm showing you here are ROC curves again for regularized log logistic regression, as well as um, two different random forest models learning, learned using somewhat different representation of, this, of the data, and then a, a particular type of deep network and LSTM that's quite well suited for sequential data like we have here. And, and what you're seeing is that the models are all very comparable in terms of their predictive accuracy, right? And logistic regression seems to be as good as, as the very fancy models. So turning away from, from our group, here's, um, here's another recent study, fairly high profile one, where they looked at predicting inpatient mort mortality, uh, readmission, and another task. This was done by uh, a very strong group, both on the machine learning side and the clinical side. And as you can see from the title, right, is that deep learning has big success in, in making these predictions. And if you dig into the, the supplement for this paper, though, what you see is that now they're comparing against logistic regression baselines. So in this table here, what you're looking at is we have the three different tasks they considered. That's the, the, the kind of the horizontal grouping. And then for each task on the top row, they're showing the area under the ROC curve for the deep learning models. And then below that are three logistic regression baselines. And what you can see is for each of these tasks, if you look at the 95% confidence interval of the best logistic regression and the deep network, they're overlapping, right? So I think they're probably getting some predictive value from the deep network here, but it's really pretty small. And so I would just argue that, um, again, I think it's always a good idea to look at simple linear models. It's always good, I think, to be skeptical of some of the deep learning hype. And that's not to say there haven't been real big successes by deep learning and some other machine learning methods, right? So all of the state-of-the-art models for computer vision, image analysis, for natural language processing, all of those are, are based on deep net architectures these days. And I think in the, in the medical domain that, that the, um, the applications that are looking at image data also are seeing a big win from deep learning. There's a concern, though, that if you have a black box model like some deep network or a random forest or a gradient boosted set of trees, that you've now completely lost interpretability, right? Which may be important for understanding what is the model telling you about the application domain or being able to trust that model in a clinical setting. And so my, my fifth point that I want to make is that 
I would argue that in many of these domains that we have uh, fairly good and, and certainly emerging tools for taking a complicated black box and trying to elicit some understanding from that black box. So this is a, a task that um, actually I worked on when I was a grad student. And every 23 years or so, I like to come back and publish on this, this topic again. Um, so as a grad student, I worked on methods where we could take a, a black box model and map it to a more interpretable representation, specifically a decision tree that provided a good approximation. So more recently with my students, Cuban Lee and Akshay Sood, we've been looking at uh, trying to identify, given a black box models, what are the important features, groups of features, and interactions among them. Let me just check my time here. OK, so, so kind of the gist of our approach is an idea. One minute, OK. Oh, OK, OK. So maybe what I'll, I will do is kind of just skip over the method here and tell you that, that uh, what we're trying to do is identify important features, again, taking into account structure we know among those features, right? doing this in a hierarchical fashion. And so one case where we've done this is, um, is in the case of looking at that deep network that's making predictions about asthma exacerbations. Okay, so this is, again, a complicated black box model, makes good, pretty good predictions. And one of the things we can do is we can take all the features it, it's, it's using and now do a hierarchical analysis and try to, try to identify at what resolution can we say that a feature or some group of features has a statistically significant effect on the predictive accuracy of that model. And so here's part of that analysis where we're looking at the diagnoses, past diagnoses that the model's been given. And then what we can do is we can drill down into this and we can see, not surprisingly, that if you look at diseases of the respiratory system, that recent recordings of those tend to be important for predicting future exacerbations. But we can see other things like uh, another important branch down here are um, is the set of diagnoses for mental disorders. And in fact, this is a case where we can't say that any specific diagnosis looks to be important, but collectively as a group, those seem to be important in predicting asthma exacerbations. And there's, there's literature supporting why this might be the case as well. So just, just to wrap up, what I tried to do was convey what I would see as five lessons that we've seen from our studies in learning predictive risk assessment models. We, uh, we have half an hour for lunch, uh, so rather than let, letting somebody ask questions and keeping us all from lunch, we're going to ask that you get lunch, come back, and, and we're going to start again in, uh, at 1. So, so lunch is, is behind us here. Uh, I have to remind our federal um, guests that you have to pay, sorry, um, but everybody else, it should be within your per diem. Um, and so if you would bring it bring it back, I think is, is probably the simplest thing um, so that we can start right at one o'clock. Thank you very much, Mark. <laughs>